Hey everyone, uh, before you go on and learn about advanced declarative macro patterns, I just want to talk to you uh, for a bit because it's been a minute that I haven't posted in this channel. Um, aside from my day job, I've been busy with a lot of projects that I've been working on recently. And one of these projects was an intro to Rust course that I put together with uh, folks from Udacity, the online learning platform. And the video that you were about to watch is a video that I posted on their platform as part of the course. So um, I got permission from them to post the video, um, well, in here, in its entirety. So I hope you enjoy. And oh, and do stick around to the end if you want to hear more about the course, if you're interested, and, um, and get a discount. So yeah, enjoy, and I'll see you then. At this point, you should be capable of writing declarative macros using fragment specifiers and repetition markers. But those are not all the tools we have. In this lesson, we'll cover meta variable expressions, scoping, and also some useful patterns to know. Starting with meta variable expressions. These are special expressions you can use in macros to transform the input or macros in some way, or obtain information about the input of a macro, sort of like asking for their ID. Let's look at this in code. In particular, I want to highlight line three where we're using a meta variable expression called stringify to convert our x meta variable into a string. This is an example of a meta variable expression that transforms our input. If we remove the stringify call, this code would not compile as my bar isn't really defined anywhere. Now, I won't get to cover all meta variables uh, or meta variable expressions that are out there, like count, index, length, nor. But to learn more about these, I'll recommend checking out and use a little homework assignment, the Little Book of Macros, or Little Book of Rust Macros, which is a great resource for getting very in-depth info on Rust macros. Now, you've reached a point in your Rust career where you're out here posting crates left and right for others to use. A lot of your crates could contain macros that you want other users to use. And the way you explore macros like that is like so. With this macro export attribute macro. But there's stuff to keep in mind here. Take a look at this. In this example, we have a macro export of this macro that calls some function. If we run this code, we'll see it compiles and works as expected. But if we were to use this macro from another crate, it would try to refer to some function within its callings or the calling crate scope. So most probably you would get a cannot find some function error. So how do we fix that? We can fix it by utilizing a special meta variable called Rate to refer to the context where the macro is defined. This, other than helping us achieve our goal, is also a good hygiene tip for your macros. You should always make sure your macros don't accidentally interfere with other code and minimize their side effects. Now let's shift gears and talk a bit about macro scoping quirks. Okay, so as you learned in lesson three, a child cannot access a parent's element, right? Like, take a look at this example. We have a mod A that has this function um, called test that tries to call a parent function called some function. If we run this, we get, surprise, surprise, an error. But what if instead we had this? That is, instead of using a function, we use a macro. Well, then that works. So unlike everything else in the language, declarative macros remain visible in some modules. But it doesn't stop there. Say that we had this instead. That is, we define the macro after our module. Well, then we get an error saying that the macro cannot be found which once again shows that, unlike everything else in the language, 
macros are only accessible after their definition. There's probably more of these quirks that I could highlight, but I'll leave it at that. Just something to keep in mind when you're developing your own macros. Now, something else that is useful to know when implementing your own macros are macro coding patterns. That is strategies that people often use when developing macros. In this lesson, I'll cover three of them. Match all, callback, and PT munchers. But once again, there's a ton. And I encourage you to read about them in the little book of Rust macros. In particular, the section of patterns and building blocks. All right, with that out of the way, let's talk about matching all. When we use match statements, we have something to match all options. Just like this. Now, there's something equivalent in macros, and it looks like this. So, we're using a repetition of zero or more PTs or token trees, which is a very flexible fragment specifier as it encompasses literals, identifiers, expressions, type decorations, punctuation, keywords, or even entire blocks of code. Pairing that together with our repetition marker essentially matches anything that is valid Rust. All right, with that out of the way, let's cycle callbacks. In particular, let's start off by looking at this example. So we have a declarative macro called recognize tree that matches specific inputs like large or oak. If it doesn't match anything, we use a match all pattern to print unknown tree. Then we also have a expand to large macro that just expands to large. In the main function, we have two calls to recognize tree. One with a direct large input and another with a call to expand to large inside of the call to recognize tree macro. So what do you think would be the output of this? One would expect they would be the output of two expansions of the large arm of the recognized tree macro. However, we get this recognized large tree and unknown tree. And the weirdest of all, it's telling us that our expand to large is unused. So what's going on? The reason we get this output is because macros are expanded from the outside in. So recognized tree gets expanded before expand to large. This means we're quite literally passing the word expand to large to recognize tree. Definitely isn't a tree. So essentially, it is impossible to chain macro calls like this. And to get around it, we use callbacks, just like this. So note, instead of that expand to large, we have this call with large that, as its input, expects a macro to well call with large. This, at the end, lets us pretty much work around expansion rules by making something expand onto a macro call. Running this, we get what we wanted. Perfect. With this, we're ready to move on to the last pattern of this video. PT munchers. PT munchers are a very powerful technique that allows recursive parsing of inputs. You can think of it sort of as a conveyor belt where each item on it is a token to be processed by the macro before it continues down the belt. In code, using this pattern can look like this. So here we have a macro called count token trees, and it matches two patterns. One is a base empty pattern where it just expands to zero. The other matches one token tree by itself and also a repetition of zero or more token trees that expands to one plus a recursive call this count token trees macro with that repetition of zero or more token trees. As you can probably tell, this will repeat until we have no more token trees and the macro just expands to zero. Hence, allowing us to use macros to recursively count the number of token trees passed. 
running this, we get five. Exactly the number of tokens we passed in with A, B, C, D, and E. All right, and with that, we finished our section on advanced declarative macros. In this video, we covered meta variable expressions like stringify, how to export your macros with the macro export attribute, together with some uh, tips on hygiene with the create meta variable, and also some quirks you might encounter in the wild with the macros and scoping. Finally, to finish off, we covered some macro patterns like match all with uh, repetition of token trees, callbacks, and also token tree launchers. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. All right, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I really wanted to post this video in specific because macros was a topic that I hadn't had the chance to cover in the Rust playlist on this channel just yet. And also because I hadn't seen anyone else cover the advanced patterns bit, like the launchers and so on, in video format anywhere else. So I thought there was a little bit of value there in itself. Anyway, like I mentioned at the beginning, um, this lesson is part of a bigger course called uh, Intro to Rust that I put together with um, Udacity. So if you're considering enrolling, I just wanted to let you know that if you've been following the channel for a while, the first three lessons will mostly be review for you. That's where I cover the beginnings of Rust. So things like ownership, um, the borrow checker, mutability, lifetimes, error handling, pattern matching, testing. Um, those things are all covered in lessons one through three. So um, again, if you've been following the channel for a while, those topics will be review. Oh, two things that I do cover in lesson three that I haven't covered in this channel is um, using cargo benchmarking. So, you know, benchmarking the performance of your code and um, also debugging uh, just a little bit. Obviously, lessons one, two, three, they still have value in themselves because um, they have professionals editing the videos and um, adding animations and so on, which are definitely things that I did not do for the videos of this channel because I couldn't even if I wanted to, because I don't know how. Anyway, um, mostly content, new content for watchers of this channel will come in with lessons four and five. That's where I cover um, things like macros, like the video you just watched, but not just declarative macros, also procedural macros, um, but also topics like FFI, right, foreign functional interface, for communicating between Rust and um, other languages bidirectionally, uh, like C and so on. Um, lesson five, I also cover multi-threading, which is something I already covered in this channel. But there, I also cover another um, method of concurrency uh, with async and await. Um, another thing from the course is that in there, I put a lot of work into quizzes and exercises. And there's also a project where you build a game engine from scratch using Rust, which you might be interested in. Um, with these videos in the YouTube channel, while they are free, you know, I can never offer you a certificate. So if you're looking to get certified with Rust, maybe the course is a good way to do so. So if after hearing all this, you're interested, um, you can use a discount code that I've been given. It's um, DANBUGS40. So that's D-A-N-B-U-G-S 40. So far four zero, um, which is valid for 90 days. So until January 2025-ish. That's when it's valid still. And they'll give you a 40% discount on a Udacity subscription, which gives you access not only to my course, but every other course in the platform. So yeah, um, that will be it for me now. And I'll see you next time, which I hope will be soon. Bye-bye.